This is Take 5 with J.K. Strategies. Welcome, friends, to Take 5. This is Jack Calvertinus, and it's our chance to spend time with leading Washington, D.C. policy and business leaders. And today, I'm especially happy to welcome Eric Hargan. Hey. Eric, welcome. Thanks, Jack. Good to be here. Eric is founder of the Hargan Group. He's the former Deputy Secretary of HHS, the former Acting Secretary in a previous administration, the Deputy General Counsel, and a leading uh, private sector healthcare lawyer. So in your life, you've worn a lot of hats. Right. And uh, now you have founded the Hargan Group. Yes. And we uh, we really appreciate you being here, and, uh, and especially considering what we were just talking about with your crazy busy schedule. Yeah, yeah great to be here. Uh, and happy, happy to talk with you. We've known each other a long time. Yep. Um, and you know, one thing that I've been, you know, noticing, and I, I see it constantly on my LinkedIn feed, is just the the variety of what you're doing. I mean, the consulting mm-hmm. work, the board memberships, the academic partnerships, and all of the speaking that you're doing at conferences and some of your op eds. One of which I want to talk about a little bit later. Sure. Uh, but re- really impressive. Yeah. Well, thanks. It's uh, it's been great. You know. Normally, I'd always go back to law firm because I was a lawyer mm-hmm. uh, by by profession. But uh, now I'm doing this consulting work, and it's really great. Actually, you you really get to see the impact on people and you know their enterprises, and so it's good to see it. You get it a little bit more distantly as an attorney, but in consulting, you see sort of right up close what they're doing. So it's it's great to be able to help in that way. And and the board memberships, you know, university hospitals in Cleveland, and some uh, some startups like Leo Medical and Tomorrow Health, just really glad to be able to help them, uh, help them along. And, and, and also the same thing with the academic work mm-hmm. that I've been doing, teaching. I taught before in Chicago in law school, but uh, teaching at Vanderbilt Business School last semester and now at Cornell at the Policy School this semester has been uh, an interesting experience to sort of see it from those different, those different perspectives and, and kind of pass on some of the knowledge about uh, that I've accumulated over a lifetime in healthcare. So it's been interesting experience. I'm glad students are getting a chance to hear from, you know, former government leaders like yourself right. in the administrations that we served in. And in addition to the, some of the speaking conferences that I'm, that I'm seeing, I mean, there's an interesting thing that uh, I was told. So I looked it up this morning and it just posted, which is a video that you uh, taped on a very important topic with right. the uh, famous Kathy Ireland. And the right. two of you did this joint video. Do you want to talk about that for a moment? Yes. You know, uh, Kathy Ireland, you know, I mean, we all know her from, you know, years ago as, uh, you know, supermodel. And, and, yeah. and she, has, she has developed... A, a serious passion for helping people with mental and behavioral health issues. And so we're very much aligned on that. And, you know, she's such a great spokeswoman for these issues and getting out there and trying to bring attention to these issues. And so we had come across each other uh, working with the telehealth company that she's on the board of. And so we sort of ran into each other and thought, you know, it'd be good for us to kind of team up with each other yeah. to bring attention to these issues and to the role that really exploding role that telemedicine is playing in American medicine right now. And, you know, so, you know, uh, you know, it's, uh, but it's interesting. It's not, it's not something that I had, it's one of those great serendipities is, you know, now working with Kathy Ireland uh, on issues like this, but that's, you know, that's, that's life. That's how, yeah. you know, it, all kinds of different people come into your lives. It's one of the, uh, it's one of the great things about uh, about working in an area like healthcare, you run across a lot of people who have passion and mission for things like this, including, you know, great people like Kathy Ireland. Well, we uh, we talked about it briefly before, but I mean, we we've talked we've worked together on many issues over the years. And I was thinking about it, you know, in two thousand five in the Bush administration, pandemic planning went to. All 50 states because of Secretary Levitt's leadership and wanting to do right. that when the first pandemic plan was created and BARDA was uh, stood up and the rollout of Part D. And then you fast forward to 2017 when I was on the transition team at the FDA. And then because of circumstances, you became, you went from deputy secretary to acting secretary. And I remember right. welcoming you to the FDA headquarters as our new acting secretary. Right. Um, and then a whole host of things, including working very closely in your role as deputy secretary with the American Indian and Alaska Native community, right. uh, both here in Washington, but all around the country, uh, there was a really historic level of engagement that I heard 
our own partners within that healthcare community of, of Native Americans saying, we had never seen this level of engagement for, which really came to life with that trip that we took to Alaska, which was right. the largest meeting of national healthcare leaders and then visits to uh, villages ever, ever in history by an HHS leader. And yeah. you know, I thought about that and what you just said about substance abuse and mental health, which we heard so much about, and right. I distinctly remember that one telemedicine clinic that we visited. I wonder if you could just talk to us more yeah. about your work in telemedicine and the lessons that you learned in visiting some of these remote locations. Yes. You know, I mean, Alaska is such an enormous state. I think people rarely realize that if you put the end of the panhandle of Alaska on like Charleston, South Carolina, the Aleutian Islands go to about to San Diego. It's almost as wide as the United it's States. Unbelievable. The lower people 48. don't realize people it. don't realize how big a state it is. And that means that the population is all over the all over the place, really. Mm -hmm. And so rural and remote care and telemedicine have been a part of Alaska's health, Alaska healthcare for a long time, decades. And so they have a lot of lessons uh, to teach us in the lower 48 as telemedicine has, by the advent of the pandemic, turned into a real serious part of American medicine throughout the country. But Alaska got there first. They've been working on this for literally decades. And so it's a very sophisticated approach to it because they had to, you know, they say they necessity is the mother of invention and necessity in Alaska meant that they've been working in this space for a long time. So there's a lot there, uh, a lot of wisdom there. And, you know, the, the tribes in the same way, they're in the same uh, area, they often have very spread out populations over their areas. And so Tribal lands and the tribal uh, healthcare systems have a have sort of beyond where we had been and the rest of the country in terms of implementing it and using it for the help of their people. I remember how important the discussions that we had on connection and connectivity and what yeah. happens to patients and uh, you know using you know using s satellite and the lack of broadband. You want yeah. to talk a little bit about the importance yeah. of connectivity there, but also in the lower forty-eight. Yeah, you know, it was uh, my last trip in office actually in January of twenty twenty-one was to Alaska uh, to announce ah. this rural health broadband initiative that we. Uh, launched at that time. It was actually an unusual collaboration. It was between HHS, the Department of Agriculture, and the FCC. So these are not <laughs> these are not uh, agencies or departments that generally work with each other, yes. not the three of us together. Uh, so it was an in unusual initiative. And, you know, I'm really hopeful. That was kind of a five-year initiative, so I'm hopeful that the current administration sort of keeps the steam up on that uh, and builds that out because, you know, w we found that there were gaps all over the place. I mean, I grew up in a rural hospital in southern Illinois. Illinois. We thought it was rural until I went to Alaska. You know, <laughs> there's a difference between rural in Illinois and rural in Alaska. But uh, because we visit villages where there's no roads to those villages, no you need roads. to come in in a float plane. Yeah, yeah, they come in by plane, or if it's by boat, or yeah. you know, or snowmobile uh, in the winter. It's it's really uh, difficult to get to these places. Very small. Uh, villages in many cases, and so you, and you don't have planes coming in constantly. So broadband and the ability to kind of remotely connect is mm -hmm. one of the best solutions that they could have, and it's true of a lot of part of rural America as well. So hopeful that the steam stays up on this because it's kind of it's a kind of infrastructure building that I think will help everybody, uh, and it's the kind of thing that you know I think everyone can get behind. I don't think that there's any partisanship or any leaning in this area. This just needs needs to get done. Let's shift over to uh, the pandemic and in particular Operation Warp Speed, which um, even though I left the administration before the pandemic, I just feel strongly that not enough attention has been paid to the amazing work that was done by a range of leaders and people, bipartisan effort, career, political. Um, talk to us a little bit about the role you you played um, with Operation Warp Speed, and then I just wanted to ask you about a recent column that you wrote about CDC messaging. Right. So you know that was an all hands on deck uh, effort. That you know when you spend your lifetime in healthcare, you sort of you sort of think of the the high points, the things that you're able to do. I think Operation Warp Speed will, for me at least, will always be kind of I think an inflection point. Uh, from from my career in healthcare, where you know you're sort of right there in the middle of something that is of great moment, and I think of great historical importance. Um, and we don't know 
what the judgment of history will be. Nobody does, right? We're still living through it. It'll take people decades from now to kind of look back on this and get the right perspective. But, you know, I think that being able to, um, as sort of the, as a deputy secretary, just kind of the chief operating officer. So you're in charge of regulations and budget and operations for that. To be able to dig in uh, in the way that you can uh, as the sort of COO of the department to be able to facilitate that. You know, I was on the board of Warp Speed. We were following it all the time. Obviously, it was it was centerpiece of a lot of what we were doing at the department at the time, especially once you realized that this was not the sort of stop and start issue that we had sometimes in the Bush administration, you know, with the avian flu scare and a number of things that came and went. This was something that was going to be here and we had to get a vaccine and therapeutics to put an end to it um, and following down so many different paths to try to get there. And of course, it was successful uh, in, I think, historic. Uh, historically, I mean, yeah. there's I, it hasn't been done before. Um, and it's something that the lessons from it, I think, have to be taken so we can replicate this again. Uh, you know, because I think that finding out the ways in which we could change procedures, I mean, sometimes it's just bureaucracy. Uh, it's just something where it can be done. Some things only in the case of emergency, some things could be permanent changes that could mm -hmm. happen in here. And I hope that those are taken away and it doesn't just turn into kind of a one-time only uh, issue where everybody just kind of like walks away from the pandemic and goes, well, that was all the pandemic. I think people have to look at this and say, there are permanent ways that we could permanent things we could change about how we approach these issues of innovation, manufacturing, bringing things to light. I think that we could do this over again. Some things, no. You can't have more than one top priority, right? This was a top yeah. priority. It was a national emergency. You can't do, you can't operate on emergency systems all the time. That's not how government or anything, frankly, can work. But um, I think that there's enough there. And I hope that both the current administration and any and in the future, people keep sort of looking back on this and looking at it reflectively, uh, and yes. figuring out what what we did right, what we did wrong. But a lot of it was it was successful ultimately, uh, and more than successful. We didn't just end up with one vaccine; we ended up with three at least. Uh, you could count AstraZeneca in there as well because mm -hmm. they were one of the warp speed vaccines. Mm -hmm. They haven't been approved in the United States yet, but it could. you could count four and a number of therapeutics that have been brought forward because of it. Uh, so I think there have been a lot of lives saved uh, you know, because of that effort uh, that really turned it from a four to five year average uh, development yes. scenario for vaccines to eight months more or less, from stop to start. And that's a huge telescoping of the time, and that's a lot of lives saved. Everybody knew what was on the line, uh, and, and they worked fairly seamlessly. You know, it's a human endeavor, so nothing's ever perfect, but that's, in, in a way, I think, I think we need to keep paying attention to this, and not in a, you know, let's pat ourselves on the back all the time, but like, we really did something right, um, and we did it with, with great speed and and to be able to say, well, this we can't do again, but this we could, I think it's important that we do that and not just sort of ignore it um, and sort of sweep it under and say, yeah, it's just one of those things. You know, we'll look back on these pictures and go, there I am wearing a mask in a picture and go like, well, that's the pandemic, you know, or people are worried about PPE and all these things everybody has yeah. learned right this time. And hopefully we move on from this, but don't forget it. So well said, and, and kudos to you and the entire team for what, what for what was done. And um, so much more needs to be said. I know that Scott Gottlieb, for instance, has talked about some of the structural changes with the CDC that probably should occur. I know your our former colleague Paul Mango um, has a book coming out, and right. he's I'm sure going to have some things to say as well on that front. You know, t talk to us about your your recent column that you wrote, and um, you talked about CDC messaging failures. And if you could just elaborate on this one line that just stuck out to me, which is, "quote unquote," CDC recommends has become an internet meme. Yeah, and uh, it's it's very sad to me to see you know how how this communications failure has impacted so many lives since people take the words of our federal health officials to heart to then make very important local decisions. If you could just elaborate on 
on that. Yeah, you know, I mean, I have teenagers, and, you know, they're on, you know, all those things, TikTok and what have you, looking at it. And CDC recommends is out there as like an item of mockery because, and, and that's, does, that's not good. I mean, it's not just good for CDC. I'm sure that they don't like it, but it's not good for any of us yeah. to have our premier public health agency being widely mocked uh, because of the sort of the changes uh, over time or lack of changes over time. Uh, those are those are all issues that that the CDC, but it's not just CDC. It's the public health community at large, really. I mean, the CDC has been sort of front and center on this, but not just them. I mean, uh, everyone knows about their local authorities changing their recommendations and 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 sort of the back and forth, and the seeming unendingness of this pandemic uh, throughout the country in in various locales that I think has led to widespread distrust of our public health authorities in 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 some ways the medical establishment the federal government's health authorities, a lot has been cast into, there, there's now, people don't know who to turn to or who to trust in this area. Uh, and it was avoidable, I think, not entirely, because science changes, and people have to change with the science. You don't sort of stay in one place. Uh, mm -hmm. The COVID-19 had different characteristics than other viruses, and the response to it had to be different because of that. But that doesn't mean that some of the ways that these things were approached in terms of messaging had to go the way they did. Uh, and I think that that's, that's the problem. You know, like you can't have, you can't be turned into an item of mockery when you're supposed to be a trusted authority and a source of knowledge and recommendations for people for how they live their lives. It's important to them. This is their health care. This is their lives. And so they're going to pay attention to it. And that's, that has been a problem. Oh, thank, thank, thank you for that. And I think that, um, you know, when planning efforts have taken place over the decades, no one could have imagined two things. One, that an Operation Warp Speed using the existing resources would be such a success. And then secondly, the level of uh, mandates and the level of shifting uh, messaging and the unwillingness to sort of let go of those short-term mitigation efforts. No, none of that was planned, and there are a lot of lessons here that we've all learned. Yeah, I think it's it's part of learning, and it's also part of relearning. People have to look back on what had been people had planned for. Was that plan followed? Um, you know, those, mm -hmm. those items of people staying sort of two years in a pandemic state of emergency is not really something that was part of the plan. Um, that's not how people had thought you approach a pandemic. These are, there are sort of larger issues here where I think we need to go back and map what the response was and what the recommendations were and whether they fit both with the sort of older wisdom, but also you have to update that. I mean, we've got a lot yeah. of new data now. You can't sort of say, well, it, it, you know, this is what we thought it would do before. You can't just sort of retreat back to what the older doctrine was on how to treat pandemics, put in the new data, but admit that there were things here that were done poorly and wrongly. There were things that were, as you say, there were things that were persisted in, uh, no doubt, way too long, not just for public tolerance, but based on even best understandings of the science. Uh, you know, And in a case where, as anyone who's honest about it will say, the science, it never goes always in one direction. Right, it's always sort of it's it's always yeah. evolving. It's always it's changing. Evolving. It goes in different directions. There's a study says this, study says that, uh, and people need to acknowledge that. And I think that if you trust the American people and you're sort of straightforward with them about what you know and what you don't, I think they'll trust you back. But you got to trust them. They'll trust you back. You have to be there and and realize that you know people don't have time as a person that does this full time. People do this full time, have time to pay attention to every little detail. American people don't, so they're not going to sit down and nickel and dime you about every little thing, you know. But you yeah. have to you have to be straightforward about the facts that you know in the science and and work from there. And I think, unfortunately, the there's been a mixture between the policy that's adopted and the science, and it's inevitable. But the two got commingled in a way that um, I think has harmed. Uh, the authority of the scientists, unfortunately. 
Well, on that note, I want to thank you. So appreciate you coming on, sure. he hearing your voice on these important topics, hearing your voice in the public sphere with your op-eds that you're doing and you're speaking, sure. and the important work that you're doing with uh, innovators and with academic institutions and others. So thank sure. you very much for coming, Eric. Thanks, Jack. Great to talk with you again. Always great to talk with an old friend. And thanks for having me on. I'm glad to be able to get some of these messages out in, in, in your venue. Thank you.